Hola, universe. It is 2.38 a.m., and I'm still in the process of finishing the last 10 episodes. Uh, I do a 10-episode review on the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 episodes. I just look back at the 10 before that, so I'm looking at 10 through 19 right now. And, uh, well, I've done 10, 11, and 12, but I wanted to... I wanted to clarify that um, there's there's really no purpose here um, with any kind of intention to uh, prescribe some sort of routine of life that um, that offers improvement. Um, I just know that I walked into a situation of a much more fulfilling life. A mystery I've been trying to solve my whole life, really, and I and I walked into it like like you uh, like you walk into a spider web, and it uh, it has been it has been the one thing I truly had given up on believing life had to offer me was purpose, fulfillment, and the. I'm not elated all the time, but I go through vacillations between feeling that I'm, I'm, <laughs> that I am doing my duty as a citizen, that uh, in that obligation, I'm fulfilled. That is the minimum I'm getting out of life right now. And everything from there upward includes realizing how much I enjoy time spent with the people around me, realizing how much I enjoy doing things to improve my life, realizing how much I enjoy thinking through problems and coming up with <laughs> more problems. But uh, so did I always have a life that was enjoyable? Probably. But had I talked myself out of enjoying my life? Definitely. Um, so as I walk back through these next few that I know are truly emotional and make me, um, if anything, <laughs> not look happy, not sound happy, not relay uh, content and, I don't know. I, I was always unsure that people who said you'll never find love in the world until you love yourself, eh, well, I thought they probably knew what they were talking about, but I didn't give them credit for having actually achieved it. Although, in some cases I did. There are some people with their shit together out there. But I was never one of them. Never felt like I was going to be one of them. And when I had my most hmm, uh, stark realization conversations internally about what was going wrong, that all the damage in my life was accumulating, well, I think ultimately... When you, when you follow analytical pursuit to the end, when you get to that not smart enough to figure it all out crossroads and decide this is probably the last time to go left or right, because if you go forward here, it's just a nonstop train of never figured it out. So... I'm not really feeling like I deserve to take a left or a right as much as I had already thrown into the pot. I just went all in and removed myself and figured at least I had, at least I'd seen what chaos and anarchy and nihilism, if that's your holy trifecta, well, I knew what that looked like and it didn't look good, but it looked real. It looked like what I was unfortunate enough to be clued in on as the way shit goes down. And then it all changed. It all changed. Not from my own doing. That's the worst part. I just started finding myself in better situations. I found myself acting more like the person I always wondered why I couldn't I couldn't manifest in moments that mattered. 
why I could have these conversations in my head, but not in my heart. And God forbid I could have them in my head and my heart. I certainly couldn't have them with somebody else. So to do this properly is essentially to say, here is everything I now see. I screwed up. Most of it thinking that I didn't deserve to fulfill opportunities starting right now. I didn't understand how much this moment is all you have. I didn't see that the, the concept of dragging baggage from your past with you is so real that all of us have it. But there is nothing that can be done about it other than to be a better you in the moment that's right here, right now, this one that I'm having, this moment. It's the only one that matters. And to do it with purpose, to even do it on a squeaky hardwood floor, well, if you're going to do that, put a towel down. But having purpose was the only thing I felt I really did get shortchanged on. Because of all the things to not be able to figure out was what to point your <laughs> the engine toward and build track to get there and do your destiny. It just wasn't there. It wasn't there. It wasn't there. It wasn't there. Because I walked into a world that as I, as I finally figured out at the end, what I was there to solve was something completely different than what society had talked me into being the problem, reaction, solution scenarios that, <clears throat> that I've been trained to, to, to embrace, well, okay, I'm a fucking moron, I'm an idiot, I, ha ha, you got me, you got me, society got me, twisted me up from the time I was about eight, till the time I was about 48, and then, I don't know, I just stopped being crazy. Or maybe I started finally being the right brand of crazy. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not anything for anybody else other than kind, understanding, forgiving, truthful, and full of enthusiasm for this moment, sharing it with you, whoever you are. I don't even know. But it's an enthusiastic moment for me to know that I'm bringing my real self to you, regardless of how you'll react. Because I now see that my contribution to this world is a net positive if I just will be myself. So I'm going to go listen to all the ways I wasn't myself, and we'll finish this up in a few. But while I at least had that much clear, sometimes I don't get stuff out while I'm thinking it through in a way that I think I have it worth recording. So I'm sure I'll listen to this and think, oh, that's what you thought was worth recording. But for now, well, we know the routine here. Oh, hello. What is that sound effect for? Oh, it's unlocking my phone, right? Okay, I can probably turn that on to something less annoying. But for now, here's the pause button. Uh, okay, unpause. Hold on, pause. Unpause. Um, so that was, uh, a healthy break since, uh, it's seven hours later, 9.48 a.m. I mean, hopefully not for you. That would be weird, but who knows? Maybe we're entangled particles having the same experience and time just warped for you because it warped for me. Well, it didn't warp for me. I mean, seven hours that included finishing the rest of the last 10. Uh, I mean, it's always hard to listen back on a group of them because uh, I have to uh, especially analyzing all the things that I should have done differently um, yeah that it's it it was it was um, it was not as painful in the first group because everything was so new that I just felt like I was constantly finding uh, little tweaks and and improvements that uh, were letting me feel 
the whole process was getting better. But now, I mean, I'm just like, oh, God, why do I even talk about that? Where am I? And I know this is the way that things have changed since I have become cognizant of the potential of an audience of random interaction and the inherent obligation I feel toward that audience to not, well, to as much as I can not waste their time, but more so to make sure that I'm not um, infringing <clears throat> in, uh, in a knuckle-headed capacity or as a... Um, as a unaware presence of um, disregard for what an eavesdropper may be experiencing from my conversational width and, and lack of filter. Uh, okay. But I never think um, I'm trying to um, make someone feel bad. <clears throat> I do go listen to my, uh, previous, uh, vocalizations to see where I might've accidentally done that or done that, uh, in a way that didn't come off as clever, funny, or, uh, as innocent as maybe I thought it would when I hear those rings of, well, that's not quite what I meant to have as my effect. Well, I try to correct that. And that's what, here in episode 20, I'm really up to. I'm going through the last 10, trying to find any, um, any dangling threads um, that shouldn't have been left to uh, disappear. Um, any um, inconsistencies in things I've said, that's a little harder to do because now I've said a lot of stuff, so I might be conflicting myself in places that I won't realize till I go back and listen to the whole breadth of them. And now that there are 126 of them, that's kind of an investment. But since I don't really start my job until Wednesday, I figure now's the time to do it. And I'm playing tennis with my dad at noon, so that's a couple hours from now. Uh, and... That, I think, will be the majority of what I'm committed to. I do believe I might watch a basketball game tomorrow. Because, I mean, if you aren't enjoying the St. Peter's run to excellence in the, the stage that is the NCAA Final Four, I mean, uh, that's the only game I've watched, the one where they beat Purdue. But <laughs> I forgot how much I enjoy watching this tournament. I may not be a sports fan anymore, and I'm... I'm comfortable that that's the truth now. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, okay, but there's never a better entertainment moment than to get to watch somebody realizing their potential in a moment that is also achieving their dreams. And this tournament does that. Not many... The Olympics does it a little bit. Uh, you may see it in some other sports, but this tournament does it. And so, yay. Yeah. And I'll tell you, that game yesterday was hella exciting, wasn't it, Cartman? Hella exciting. So, um, but with that limited calendar of obligation, <clears throat> well, doing chores around the house while listening to myself blab on and blab on and blab blah 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 blah. Well, I guess that's that's what it's looking like. That'll be my four-day weekend um, because I certainly have a lot of housework still to do, embarrassingly. And uh, so I'll do some before and after pictures because, again, I'm not here to hide anything. I mean, shit, man, you should see my kitchen. Certainly make you feel better about yours. Um, but let's move on. How much preamble was that? Seriously. Five minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, God, can anybody beat around the bush better than Johnny? Nope. Matter of fact, I beat around the bush so well, sometimes I forget I'm even near the bush. I'm clear over here playing golf, because what were we doing with that bush? I thought we brought golf clubs so we play golf. 
Okay, yeah, I'm coming back to the bush. I'll be right there. I'm just going to make this putt. Boom. All right, enough fantasy golf. Fantasy golf. You know, I never geeked out enough to play fantasy golf. Oh, wait, am I lying? Oh, I know I did for, for tournaments. <laughs> but I never played a full season of PGA fantasy golf. Oh, God, that may be a lie. It's hard to think. Seattle was a weird time. I might have. I played fantasy basketball, for Christ's sake, so I might have played golf. But, <clears throat> yeah, I can remember some categories now, so I must have played it. All right. Now that I've wasted six minutes and 45 seconds, <clears throat> thinking back through where these 10 episodes went, I'll tell you this. Um, I'm not coming off and thinking I necessarily want those 10 to be listened to. Um, but I'm not, I'm not, there's not a whole lot here that's, that's, I mean, there are some mistakes, but there's not a lot here that I want to walk back on and say, I, I don't know that I meant to say it that way. I mean, for instance, I'll tell you what, I really have, I feel guilty not saying God bless you for no good reason because all the rest of you do it or most of you do it. But if I don't believe in God, then saying God bless you to me is hypocritical or at least it's phony. Um, and not saying thank you for your service has been an intentional decision that I'm not saying is one I'm comfortable with. It's one I'm forced into so as not to be a hypocrite to the people who literally put their lives on their, on the line for the country. For me to say thank you for your service to those people in some sort of God bless you fashion, well, I owe them better than that. And I'm not sure that I achieved that in my thank you for showing, <clears throat> showing a level of character that I know I didn't embody. Um, but that's what I really think is a truthful recognition of of what you, and not me, did for the country. And I'm not above thanking you for your service to this country once I think this country and our military services are achieving at a level that I think we deserve a thank you generically. Otherwise, I feel like I'm just... Uh, I'm not willing to to say that those vectors have lined up enough that anything further than that, well, it's phony. And one thing it won't be anymore is phony. Now, might I have been out of line on all that? Might that be completely insensitive? Might that be the kind of thing that I'm going to learn some lessons here about how you uh, communicate effectively when uh, addressing a population who literally has put their life on the line for your candy ass to sit around and watch Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, I certainly... I, I don't know if I put in my tags for that one that uh, whenever I feel punchable-faced or punchy-faced, like maybe my face needs to be punched for some of this part, I put that in the tags. And I, I don't want to say that I've done it enough. When I go back and listen, one of the things I will do is try to tag down exactly what I think the episodes represent so that there's a little bit more um, a little bit more organization. But at the very least, some sensibility as to what rambling uh, diatribe this one entails. And I don't know that there's not a third of them that I can legitimately say there's a punchable face moment where I can understand triggering the fist of somebody who thinks my face needs to be punched. Well, I don't feel like I want to walk back anything from that episode, so I'm not going to say that I'm necessarily in that position there. I just know that I get in that position without knowing I'm in that position. And if I'm in that position now, well, I'm sure somebody will tell me, and then I'll rectify and move forward accordingly. Because, I mean, I, I don't know what you could offend me with. Well, yeah, I do know what you could offend me with. If, uh, if you... If you're the white guy on the side who tells me uh, an N-word joke as if I'm part of the club, <laughs> well, that's one moment that you're going to 
realize we are clearly not going to be even social, let alone friends. Um, that's the only thing that, that sets me off, though. And it happens so rarely. It's maybe happened four times in my entire life. And usually, two of them have definitely been on the golf course. <laughs> with random fucks on the golf course. What do you know? But, uh, yeah. That's, that's the line where if you cross it and think I'm part of that club, I'll declare with a d- defined <laughs> principle that I'm not. Um, and generally, if you think that's the club that we're all just part of, then when I draw that line, uh, it's not me that uh, has shown that we will no longer want to be t- together in social occasions. That scares you off. Because I think the racist knows that what they're really getting racial with is their insecurity that they're on the wrong team. I mean, you're not using your, hey, buddy, how's it feel to be part of the white club uh, conversation without feeling that the white club needs a little more reinforcement that it's the right place to be. I mean, unless you're flat out proud of it, in which case you should be wearing it wherever you walk. And if that's who you are, well, then, then I probably will have a conversation with you because at least you're showing me what is a real person instead of a scared person who's teaming up with team we're better than those guys because you don't know how to feel that for yourself well (laughs) i don't have much sympathy for you in those moments i don't know really even how to understand you and i'm not very forgiving uh but i'm direct and i think that is being kind because those are moments in which your your inhumanity has swelled up to the point it's bubbling over and if that's an interaction I'm having with you, I'm going to let my humanity rise to the occasion and make sure that we're clear what line I think has been crossed. And I'm not saying this with malice. I always think if that's what you think is appropriate, you just have had the wrong opportunities to think through that it's not. Or you haven't had the right opportunities? In other words, whatever opportunities are reinforcing that that's an okay thing to do, that there's an expectation that that club's wide enough to include me, even though I would set myself on fire before signing a membership card to that club. Well, again, somewhere, you found insecurities that you filled with the comfort of a racial identity that says I'm better than blankety blanks. And when I got so twisted up, I wanted to find delusional realities. Well, I had a way with lies that was slick. So I'm not hypocritical here. I understand, <clears throat> I understand the racist because I understand the self-loathing the insecurity, the doubt that you have found purpose that you fill with joining Team Whitey Whites. I'm just letting you know that that's a decision that you probably didn't even know you made. So when you hear yourself dropping your phone and um, fumbling for the buttons because I'll tell you what, If there is a person in the universe that uses their phone worse than me, (laughs) well, oh, do I feel sorry for you. But uh, walking out of the pit of um, self-satisfaction that you build from joining teams that are messaging you counterintuitive reinforcement for things that tear at your humanity it may not even be something that emerges for 20 years <laughs> but if you literally can stay in the closet that long as to how much you're getting mowed down by any sense of seeing other people as lesser than you especially in groups 
well, you have to unlearn that. You just, you just have to look at that and say, you got trained to think that way. You didn't come here with the intent to judge people on, this, on, a, on a single data point or two or three for a lifetime of human experience. <laughs> Don't be so limiting. Every individual has value to add to your life. And if you can't figure that out, then you really are the problem. And so if you're blanket joining a team so you can blanket feel better than a team that's filled with that smallpox blanket, well, I mean, history has shown you're certainly not above it. But you got to see that it comes from being broken in a way that you have to unwind. You have to forgive yourself for, for feeling like you're hollow enough to want to dislike people in groups so that your life can feel better. Just find where, where you're hurt and, and at your core disappointed in yourself and fix it. And go say hello to the next person in a random situation that has five minutes of time and strike up a very congenial conversation, just in general. If you're standing in line at the DMV to get your license renewed and the person in front of you is somebody who you normally would think you're better than, well, ask them a very friendly question like, hey, uh, what other lines might we be standing in that would be worse than this one? I wonder if we can think of two. I don't know. The line to, uh, to hell? That might be worse than DMV. I don't know what kind of uh, small talk you're capable of, but find a conversational topic that is innocuous, and that means you will not offend anybody in earshot, including the person you're starting a random conversation with. You want to find subject matter that lets you start to get to know people in a way that you're, you're learning them. You're not judging them. And I have a game that I used to play. It, it's my favorite. Um, and this is not appropriate for the line CMV. But if you have trouble uh, figuring out a way to have um, quality conversation, but conversation that's not um that's not based on on uh charged or opinionated uh subject matter it's not always wise to bring up politics uh in a conversation at a at a work mixer i mean it's not unwise but there are there are times when you're going to have to be able to uh pull out <clears throat> some conversational direction that is uh, uh, that is revealing, but not uh, invasive. And so the way I go about doing it is by playing alphabet soup. Because it's a really simple um, exchange of depth without being at all threatening. In fact, it is, by its very nature, a game of metaphor puts it in the absolutely unthreatening category for everybody, which is one of the reasons it's a good thing to do with people you don't know, because you never know what somebody's sensitive about. So you never know when you're being insensitive, especially if you're willing to talk about everything, because there are too many people who, when you bring up that subject matter, their version of what that story is, is significantly different and worse than your little trifling anecdotal story about how you stub your toe in this little emotional pain field. Some people in that pain field have lifetimes full of pain. So when you want to be goofy about it, well, you might be uh, directly affecting the people around you in a way that's not uh, 
being recognized by you in your little moment of jo joking. So I tell myself these things because when I hear myself wander around subject matter without purpose, well, I know that leads me to places that I just stumble into. And I don't mean to. I don't have the kind of um, malicious direction that I'm trying to pop myself into a darker corner and go through it. If I end up in a darker corner, I'm not going to turn around and run away from it. So I, like, I'm not good at this. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to find a way to continue talking to myself about the things that confuse me, the things that I think uh, compose me, and the things that uh, I can do with the latter to help alle alleviate, help assuage, help unwind some of the former. I don't expect to have a whole lot of answers to questions anymore. I think there's too many places in the universe now where you do not get an answer. You just live with the doubt and uncertainty that those protecting the truth are uh, unlikely to uh, release. So, fine. I'm fine with that. I'm not going to solve 9-11. I don't even want to. But I would like us to, at least as a country, come to the recognition that that whole scenario is fishy. We haven't had... this As a country, we haven't had at least in my 50 years, a reckoning for any of the fishiness this country has put itself through. Do we need to have that? I don't know. I could certainly be on board for it, but I could see where maybe I don't get that because we do something else to move past that in a way that we can have an established moment of recognizing that there are transgressions on this soil that are stains for the American nation. And having seen none of that because of my particular white male American status, that doesn't mean that it's not something that I still feel intensely. And I, I'm, uh, I don't like that wherever I see the idea of um, of a bell that has yet to be rung in the comeuppance that is the brutality this nation was built on. I do feel the guilt. I do feel the pain. It's like it lives in the soil. And and it certainly is an undercurrent of charge in the entire country. And you can claim to have shown up in a position of non-participation. You can take the same stance on what's going on in the country right now. I didn't have anything to do with it getting like this. Okay. Well, I can say for sure that in my life, I have never reinforced a stereotype about a race when one of my white brethren thinks, oh, that's the club that we're both in. Nope, we're not. Nor have I ever mistakenly thrown out that kind of uh, disregard to the universe in a casual, oops, I didn't mean that way. Because I would never, ever Oops, I didn't mean that. Because I think about everything that I say, and when I say something that is even slightly off-center there, well, I correct it. This is important to me. And so the, the thought that, that America doesn't have a reckoning here has never jived with me because of all the things that are not directly my fault, but are all my fault, the perch on which all the systemic advantage this country gave me has been something I've felt the guilt of since I realized it was there.
So somewhere in high school and college. Certainly by the day I walked into that fraternity to be told, you don't belong here. They were right. And so that in itself is enough for me to feel guilty. Because I live in a country where I was naive enough from a position of privilege to think that I had been wronged for the defensive posturing. Those transgressed against feel necessary to establish just to keep things clear. I was swimming in a muddied pond, I'll admit it. But I also know that that wasn't bullshit. I wasn't, I wasn't filled with the dumb, dumbity, dumbity, dumb of somebody who just didn't get how the real world has to be. Hell no. I was the kid that got told for 13 years, everybody's equal, everybody gets their shot, and everybody's got potential to do greatness. And uh, when I learned that that wasn't really how the world worked, well, that really was the first shattering moment where I realized I might not fit in so well. So it's easy for me when somebody wants to rub elbows with that sort of club de club hey buddy you heard the one about the uh let me just stop you before you get any further because i have a feeling where this is gonna go um and then the fact that i've only got four of those maybe five if i go think about it maybe six if i really think about it episodes of like hey that's enough um in my life it's not a bad sign i've only known nine people so it's not a great sign but the, the fact is, you do put out an energy. I, I have never used a racial slur in my life that was intentional. Um, and so, if you, and, and I'm not going to pretend that I, I have a clean slate. I, I'm, I'm just doing my best to represent somebody who thinks everybody's equal. And I am living in a world that reinforces with every subtle and direct and overt message I receive that that's not really true. So all of that shapes me. I know I've been trained to think that I'm up here on white American male perch and I deserve it. I get it. That doesn't mean that I'm by any means unaffected by it. In fact, I am subconsciously affected by it. I'm sure. So enough Mia culpas about where I stand on the race issue, but I do think that sometimes that's a subject matter that I have to get off my chest. So, thanks for listening, if you listened. And if you didn't, well, I don't even know why I'm talking to you. Okay. You can't find love until you love yourself. Well, I, I know that I can't find my voice until I go get something to drink, because that is too much talking with not enough lubrication. So, pause. Okay, unpause. Yeah, it looks like it's still recording. I'm seriously um, using... Uh-oh, I don't know if it is now. Oh, I think it is. Ah, shoot. I'm using the microphone only of the broken first round of earbuds that I got in a five-pack that... Both earbuds quit, so I assume that that means this microphone is going to quit at any moment and is probably quitting right now. Is that recording? Who knows? But if I didn't record any of the last 30 minutes, well, that's just stupid. So in case that's the point, I'm going to um, hmm, what am I going to do? Pause. Unpause. Okay. Well, that is uh, the second version of the same headset, so hopefully that's the same sound. But knowing my luck, it's significantly different in a way that's worse.
but at least I see the little bubble moving on my super voice recorder, so I do assume it's working. <clears throat> Here we go. You can't find love until you love yourself. Um, one of the um, least uh, expected fulfillments that I've gotten from the last three or four years is coming to recognize the actual wisdom of simple truths. And I, these are things that I sort of thought I had at least uh, coherently taken their wisdom way back when and ingrained it. But no, 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 no. No. No, you have to live it enough that the truth itself becomes your life. And I do now know that even the best of the women I was fortunate enough to date, and there were a lot of greats, um, I had no chance of succeeding with any of them. And by the 20th month, obviously, they all figured that out. And in some cases, they figured it out a lot quicker than that. So, um, But it was a reflective state of mind that finally got me to a point to know that. And by reflective, I mean I finally had lived enough of a life of loving myself to look back and know the mistakes I had made with a perspective I'd never had before in relationships that I knew I had blown up, for lack of a better term, with people who I really thought I wanted to make it work out. Now, inside of all of that uh, quantification is a lot of potential for self-delusion. Did I really want them to work out or am I lying to myself? Well, okay. There are certainly at least two who I can say I knew in the moment was as good as I was ever going to think I deserved or wanted. Um, and there were three or four more who I could certainly have taken one featherweight push to be right in the same circle. And another, you know, dozen that would have been a little more mental work to believe that, but not much more. In some ways, anybody who I could have felt would have stood with me for eternity, I was willing to stand next to myself. But see, if you're not willing to give that person who you really are, then you can't expect them to stand with you for eternity because if who you really are sometime comes out and is disappointing, well, then they should walk away. I mean, you, you, uh, any, any falsity that you put into a relationship with somebody that you are trying to show that you care about Anything, literally anything, is jeopardizing the future status of that relationship. Because even if it's, if it's small stuff, it's just a slippery slope. Do you need to tell somebody when you think those are the worst pants you've ever worn? Uh, maybe. Why wouldn't you? I mean, if you truly care about somebody and they put something on that you have an opinion that is, those look terrible, say it with some sensitivity, but don't not say it. That's why you're there. They're not asking you just to be reinforced. They're asking you for the, huh, that's a mistake response as well. That's what real friends do. That's what real people who care about each other do. They say, hey, before you do that, here's my thought. Now, I could be out of line because I don't know shit about pants, but those pants don't look as good as the ones that you have over there. Just my thought. That's a silly example of the value that learning to communicate in a graceful way, well, it showers your environment with people who see you as worth opening up to or and I don't even mean it like that I want you who 
will feel free to be themselves in front of. Now, they may only take that to the surface level in which you get the 10% that's available, but they'll be giving you the real 10% and not the rehearsed 10% that they give to the other jerk-offs in life. We all have a, a, a window treatment that varies from completely not there and wide open crystal view into my soul, my heart, and my inner thoughts to blackout shades. And how much of your warmth, your openness, your sensitivity with language, thought, presentation, all of that that you bring in a compassionate understanding, kind, and ready to forgive manner, believe me, it rubs off. And it, it's not even that it rubs off. It is intuited by everybody around you. And it's reinforced by all the interactions you have. And once you have somebody in that relation with you, and I'm just talking about what the world starts to give you. If you will act as your true self, you will have real moments with people, even the people who, am I banging the microphone? Even the people who are the least comfortable being themselves will show you more of themselves than they show the rest of the world. And as you start to have that experience with people, it is, it will reinforce for you how much there is to be had in the people immediately around you for anybody that becomes comfortable enough around you to be them, their real selves, they'll have rewards. It just works out that way. And... And the, the weirdest thing is, <laughs> weird, the, the least sustainable part of life for me is doing something at all, doesn't matter what it is, for a while. And I'm going to say a while is like, what, four years? Even going to college, though, or school doesn't count. School's like being in the Army. You don't really have a choice what you're going to do. And you get three months off to freak out so that you can go do it all over again. But once you have your freedom, once you are um, literally capable of doing whatever you want to do, so long as the consequences are uh, not something you can't live with, there's literally pretty much anything you want to do out there. Well, I've never found a single thing that I've been able to commit to as a personal hmm. As my foundational stones on which I think I literally can now start putting down some decorative work. <clears throat> because I know that as long as I go out when, in my day looking to understand first, in doing so, act kind. And then forgive whatever situation presents itself worthy of it. Including those especially those that involve myself. My days work out wonderfully with just that much to go by. I didn't know that that was possible. I didn't know that lists of 26 things that were going to be accomplished. That seemed like the only way I ever was going to get anything done. Nope. As a matter of fact, all that did was leave me, leave me thinking, well, I got five of them done, but I feel like a failure because there's 21 more things on my list. Well, I lived in, in a quantified finish line. Show me what you got. Show me what you've done. Show me what you're going to do tomorrow. Universe of none of it matters. To the point that I gave up. 
So why am I here? I, I don't have an explanation. But I'm here to do this because for at least another nine months and five days, this project matters to me. So there will be days when it'll be even more unlistenable than this. But not to me. Because those might be the days 10 years from now I go back and listen to the most. To try to remember what it was like to have days that I felt off, not vocally effervescent, not carbonated with my thinking, not bubbly in my vocabulary choices. We don't always have even what we think of as that which we are most inclined to enjoy and do well at. There are days when you just suck. It ain't there. Not going to happen. The more you record, the more you're going to erase. Well, for one year, I'm going to record it all. I'm going to think through everything I can think through. And I'm going to get through this list. Because now this opening diatribe, I'm sure, is at 45 minutes or something silly. Um, well, I don't even know because this app... Oh. All right. So that was the longest roundabout. Hello, yes. When it comes to describing how to figure out finally what it means to find love because you love yourself. What it means is that you give everybody around you the chance to love you as themselves. Because they don't have to worry about where they're going to plug in with you and all your chaos. They're free to be themselves around you. And why did I let that slip? I do not know. I lost a lot letting that slip. But um, I'm getting it back. And I'm certainly getting it back in a way that I appreciate it. Because in every way that I can sense somebody being not guarded, I think to myself, that matters. And I notice it. I notice when people are opening up or telling me a story that they're even surprised they're telling. I, I, I see those reactions. I recognize them. And every time they happen, I think to myself, I'm creating a better world. Just by having the opportunity to let this person be who they are. Because when I needed somebody to do the same for me, I didn't have any idea how to ask for it. So somebody had to literally give it to me. And now that I've got it to give, well, I'm glad I learned my lesson because it's the one thing that always guaranteed brings a reward for me. It may not be true for you, but it definitely works for me. Just like pausing works. But I'm going to go ahead and do this here. All right. Suppressant. Okay. 4420. Um, all right. Trying to be better versus being better. Uh -huh. Um, you, you don't, you, hmm. this is another way in which I trip myself up because I set out to be better, but I didn't understand you do that by trying to be better. Uh, I thought you just made decisions about ways to change your life and then those became the new way your life changed. Well, no, that is the long route to figuring this stuff out. If you want to be uh, somebody who um, who is not late, then literally start getting ready 10 minutes earlier than you do. Just change your behavior. You won't have to work at not being late. Or what's your whatever your window is. How late are you showing up? And do not accept a compromise on that initiative. That is such a simple thing to fix. In fact, that has fixed almost all of my lateness. And I know that I'm always pushing to be ready right on time. If you're going to pick me up at 9.15, I'm literally going to be ready at 9.15 and 44 seconds. Because I do want to get into the car 
when it still says 915 on your clock. But I wanted to say 916 as soon as I shut the door. That is asinine. <laughs> Once I recognize that, I'm thinking, wow, I'm so terrible about being structurally coordinated and on top of my shit that if I give myself 10 extra minutes just to get out the door, I'll find 10 extra minutes to fill every time. Even if it's, you know, maybe I should check out that one more YouTube video real quick for I put on my shoes. Most of the time that I'm not being productively on task, it is time I'm wasting. So message to self, I have drastically improved my on-time performance by doing one and one behavioral change only. Start getting ready 10 minutes earlier than I think I need to. So when I think I need to get ready to go play tennis at say 11.35, well, then we're going to push that to 11.25. If I start showing up 10 minutes early to everything, I can readjust. But until that's my pattern, this is at least getting me to not show up late. So when it comes to trying to be better, well, you have to just be better. And I know that sounds stupid, but for me it wasn't. Because what was stupid is how I would want to try to be better at... Um, at, hmm, what is, have I improved anything that is in my inner core? Uh, yes, I have tried to be better about, um, not directing conversation because I have a tendency to overwhelm people on subject matters that they may even have initiated. And this is an annoying way that I'm just built. If you want to talk to me about what you know about uh, cross-stitch, well, unfortunately, I have a cross-stitch story, and I'm going to tell it. Whereas that's all I have, because I don't know shit about cross-stitch. I'm not even sure if you had three tools on the table I could tell you which one you're going to use for cross-stitch. But I do have a cross-stitch story. And my way of getting to know and getting to reveal myself is through what I've experienced in life in a retelling um, and reflective way of something that I won't really be able to ever say directly. I start to open up my emotional side through storytelling. I start to open up my entire human side through storytelling. Um, and I mean about myself. Although, I didn't used to mean that. And, uh, and that's what this project really is about is I've never not liked myself, but until recently, I've never loved myself. Even as a kid. Even as a kid, that I now realize was a limitation. And I'm certainly not going to get into that for a while, but it was, it was subtle. It was so subtle that it took me really the better part of 40 years to understand that I had actually been influenced enough that I needed to deal with it. And again, this all was something I was capable of seeing once the Mandela effect and all this other shit happened where I just started thinking better. And when I say thinking better, I started thinking less linearly and more cyclical. And these are serious sidetracks I don't mean to get into because they deserve a lot more uh, uh, consideration than I'm going to be able to give them here. But that is where I have to give Lily the kind of unexpected direct influence that uh, her, her way of processing the universe 
it's lyrical and it works in rhythm and it it showed me my limitations and the potential I was failing to recognize for stopping a constant list of things I was trying to figure out and how close I was getting on that list toward that outcome. When I stopped trying to chase down every quantifiable bit of the universe and just started experiencing the universe in a way that I expected it to reveal things that would make me understand it. I hate to say it, but that shit's working. It's crazy. It is crazy. That's why I tell you I'm crazy. Crazy. Insane in the membrane. Okay. No copyright infringement intended. My membrane isn't even really that insane. A little bit. Like, <clears throat> I use numbers poorly. But I mean things like, if I finished a third of a puzzle and somebody else comes and completes two-thirds of what's left, well, that means that there's 22% of the puzzle still to finish. When I say I use numbers poorly, what I do is I say things in a way that numerically makes sense in my head, but everybody else in the universe is going to hear things weighed out, statistically awkward, numerically misrepresented, who knows. I am not very clear when I talk numerically, even though I think clearly numerically, in my head. And these recordings have revealed that. So I thought that was when I was at my most clear, and I'm starting to think it's when I'm at my most obtuse. So when I start to use fractions, percentages, and that kind of stuff, I will start to try to do them with the accuracy they deserve. And that's another thing I'm embarrassed about, is that somehow out of my ass, which is exactly where I pulled this, I pulled Egypt as a country whose loss is stacked up above and beyond that of the United States. Well, that is not even close to true. So, passing misinformation on, one of my favorite pastimes. Not. But, um, finding the list. I thought I had it in my hand, so I probably did. Yes, I did. Finding the list of... We are the arguably 19th or 18th, but most lists were the 19th country um, in terms of ranking in hierarchy for s uh, citizens lost during World War II. And these are the countries that are in front of us. Uh, according to This is according to Wikipedia. Um, the UK, we, we lost 419 or 418 or 420, <laughs> but 419 is the number most commonly uh, thrown about. Actually, 418.9 or something like that, I think is what the official... Um, record number is if you go to other sites most of them stay within a thousand of that uh, but in that range we only lost depending on the, the resource again 1200 to 2000 civilians and in one report as few as 600 but that doesn't seem possible considering some of the the events that lost civilians I don't think 600 quantifies it enough 1200 seems like it does though so we were one of the least um, affected civilian populations, if not the least of all, is certainly in the top 20. The UK is close, but they lost more civilians than we did. They also slightly more because they're next on the list and slightly more um, military personnel with 450,000 dead. Korea, I think uh, it's similar. I think it was mostly military personnel. Uh, Italy, I know there were more civilians. Anybody in the war theater of Europe or, God, the Pan or the the Pacific Asian zone. One thing I did learn doing this: I had no idea thirty million people died in the Pacific theater. I knew I I would have guessed ten, maybe fifteen, but I would never. If you told me higher, once I got to twenty, I wouldn't really believe that it could have been much higher. So thirty was shocking. And when I came to realize that at least most of that is civilian and most of it was from starvation. I mean, it's horrific. That's, and that's part of what you don't get in America. 
Because that side of war, well, all of war is awful. But people starving to death, civilians, well, again, I won't talk about the reckoning the United States has to present itself for, but if um, Team America World Police doesn't rub you the wrong way for how much truth it really has in it, then you need to take a better look at what America's up to. Um, and I understand satire. I'm not saying that's all we're up to. As a matter of fact, that movie only represents one and one myopic mania that we are, and that's America, fuck yeah. No copyright infringement intended. Coming again to save the motherfucking day now. All right. I do love that movie, but I will never, ever quote it again. Oh, that's probably not true. But Trey Parker and Matt Stone, you guys are geniuses. All right. Korea, 475,000. Italy, 502. The Philippines, 557. France, 600. Greece, 664. Romania, 830. Hungary, 965. And then we get to our first million lost club. It goes to Yugoslavia. Depending on the resource, 1.1 or 1.4 million or 1.7. French Indochina at 1.6. India, 2.2 to 3. Um, the Dutch East Indies, 3.1 to 3.5. Um, Japan, pretty much 3.1 everywhere. Um, so they, maybe they had really good records or something because I will say, well, the next 10, well, I guess there's only six left. These three... You pretty much read the same, well, okay, Japan, 3.1, almost everywhere. Poland, 6 or 5.9, everywhere. Germany, 7.4. All three of these, well, actually, Japan lost the least civilians, percentage-wise. Germany and Poland both took heavy hits, both military and civilian. Um, as did Yugoslavia, Hungary, Romania, Greece, France, Everybody in France, honestly, I would have thought France lost more civilians than they did. But still, I mean, 600,000 people. And it was a horror show for everybody involved. But nobody, nobody, nobody suffered like China and Russia. And <clears throat> when you talk about civilian deaths here... Between the two countries, you're talking about almost half the, the losses in the entire war were civilian deaths in the countries of Russia and China. Um, millions of people, 25 to 30 million civilians lost between the two countries. And Russia took the majority of it. But China's Germany is 7.4 in third place. And then you have China between 15 and 20, and most publications say 20, and some say more. And then you have Russia, who did an entire, uh, I think it was 1993, but don't hold me to that. They did an entire investigation of the losses they did take during World War II, and they came back with a number of 26.6 million people. That's their own accounting for the losses 26.6 million people. And, and I don't care how that goes down. I don't. I don't care if the leader of Russia stood everybody up in the square and shot them one at a time in the head. It's as terrible as anything else. So, oh, well, that's because they had blankety blank in office. Or, that none of that matters. None of it. These are losses that are, that are avoidable on every level. And for everyone involved, it's horrific. This destroyed the entire continent of Europe to the point that it was unrecognizable. 
Europe. I can't imagine what it must have been like to have lived in in Poland and been through this. I, I know I don't have, I don't survive these kinds of events. I can tell you that. I don't have this kind of fight in me. If this is the horror show that I am exposed to, I will quit because it's that abominable. So I don't have illusions here. I just know how horrible all of it is. That's why nobody here won. Nobody here is anything but a loser. Mankind, womankind even. But let's face it, women didn't start World War II. All right, so that is being more accurate than telling you that, yeah, you know, I think Egypt. Telling you that Egypt was a country I thought had lost twice as many uh, or twice as many citizens in World War II is the least accurate thing I've said on every recording ever. So, at least now I know what my bar on the low end is. Saying that kind of stuff, just pulling that out of my ass. I hate when I do that. As a matter of fact, looking at the, the losses for all of Africa, I think was 117,000 people. I would never have guessed that. You could have... Here are a couple of bar bets you could you could have gotten me on for sure. Over under total losses for Africa, World War II, 125,000. Uh, that's too low because that's going to look like a sucker bet, so you have to bet the low. You'd really have to give somebody more like 280. 280 is a good number because you could definitely go with lower there, maybe even like 330. But you're so far under that that you get really, really get to test your audience out and figure out which one wins. But the idea that France only lost 600,000 people in World War II in America, I bet you 9 out of 10 white male Americans think France lost at least a million people in World War II. And you set this up by having a little conversation with your white male American friend about those freedom fries and how you can't trust them French because you never know when they're just going to back out and say, well... I don't know. Looks like this 9-11 stuff has got some taint on it. We don't know what the truth is over here in France, so we're not going to just jump in there and say, okay, let's go to war. Nope. Nope, we've fallen for that ship of war. But since Americans are not sophisticated in their true knowledge of what the French have been through, they just think of the French as pussies. So if you ask them how many people over under, did France lose in World War II and give them a million? I would bet nine out of ten male Americans think, well, the French had to lose at least a million people in World War II. Had to. They're pussies. I could be wrong, but you want to make five bucks at a time in life, those two bets would be where I'd start to think you have a chance. All right, so that would also mean you'd be living for the moment. I'll talk more about living for the moment. But living for the moment, in a way I choose, is not to imply that I want to live for the moment so I can be self-centered and selfish at all times. No. I want to be able to choose where I put my charity time, as much as I want to choose where I put my effort time, as much as I want to choose where I put my individual time, as much as I want to choose where I put my private time. In other words, I would like autonomy for all of the meaningful moments I want to have in my life. I would like them to exist on my terms at all times. Now, I don't know that that's legitimately even achievable. So I'm strictly speaking to the, the optimum goal to strive toward. And then whatever uh, compromises have to get made, you start to get back where it makes the most sense. And if you're going to live in a city full of people, compromises will get made. I understand that. But that doesn't mean that I have to live in a way that I don't see my moment is my autonomy. If I choose to give it away, it'll be for the greater good. But it should be for the greater good if you're going to give it away. It shouldn't be so that you can afford food. I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong there. Um, okay, I just need to put this question down because I actually don't have the answer to this. Why do I shut down when I have bad news to relay or a bad situation to deal with? I do. I really do. I shut down from... My support system. That's what I'm talking about. Not shutting down. I 
don't shut down mentally because if anything, I think too much in those situations. So that's why there's a little arrow note that points to that. Um, yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't know that one. I don't know. I'll leave that one to think about till I have more to say. Uh, I do have to give credit to the Oppenheimer Ranch group. I believe the guy uh, on YouTube is named Diamond uh, and Randall Carlson. If you are looking to understand the woolly mammoth implications, <clears throat> the problem is there are only so many ways to quick freeze a, a 10,000, 12,000 pound animal. It, it is, it is the sort of limited <laughs> physical possibility that includes things like, um, exposed to a cloud of liquid nitrogen. I, I mean, you have to think of something that literally takes them from having lunch because not only were there uh there there were was plant material in their stomachs that could be not just identified but could be unfurled it was it was undigested it had literally just been swallowed because not only was that available but there was plant matter in the animal's mouth So whatever killed it broke its two hind legs in a in what looks like an impaled backward. In other words, something blew it backward with enough force to break its back hind legs, freeze it with food in its mouth, and then bury it until we dig it up 12,000 years later. There are only so many things that can do that. I don't know if there's enough cold in an onslaught of flooded water to do that. I and mean, there's enough force to put him in the position, but would it freeze him that fast? I don't know. So what would a complete loss of atmosphere? I don't know. I really don't know. But why we're not working on that problem? Huh. Some people are. And that's why I make sure to pay attention when <clears throat> I have found those two resources. Oppenheimer Ranch Project, I believe it's called. Diamond, I believe, is the uh, person you're looking for. And I would say, well, Randall Carlson is just as valuable in the... Uh, in the geo Rex series, I believe it's called his podcast. They're early ones. He's standing in a classroom giving a lecture with, uh, with consistent audio for him, but tough audio for the, uh, students in the classroom. Just know that going in, but all you need to do is hear what he has to say. And there are visual, uh, cues that will make it very clear. It's, it's very accessible. Um, and then what diamond does at Oppenheimer ranch project is, walk you through the uh the value and the uh the nonsense that is floating about on the internet about what looks like a very plausible uh crustal uh shifting uh scenario for the ultimate catastrophe because another thing that could happen is you could be standing there having your lunch and all of a sudden the entire crust of the earth moves 3,000 miles to the north in a matter of seconds. Well, you just went from, say, 85 degrees Fahrenheit to 20 below. So that helps with the whole, how does he get frozen so fast? But that doesn't really freeze him in the condition he's in. 
So maybe as the crust displaces, an entire release of methane gas or something gets caught up and he's trapped in that. I mean, why are we not working on this? I said there were 900, maybe 1800, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of woolly mammoths, perhaps millions, they estimate, are buried in this northern Siberia graveyard of woolly mammoth remains. It is shocking to see the warehouse full of woolly mammoth bones, mostly tusks, that you can see in some early photographs from this resource that has been getting pillaged for a hundred years. And it still is sustaining this community that sells the ivory. That's how many woolly mammoths are buried in this location in Siberia. So I was a little off when I said there were 900 to 1800. Now I was saying that in comparison to other specimens that unfortunately show this same level of trauma. There are plenty of specimens, including woolly mammoths, but across North America, across much of the Siberian region. And it's not just woolly mammoths. They're finding woolly rhinoceros. They're finding that um, whatever uh, snouted uh, <laughs> sort of a cross between a pig and a cow. I don't even know what that thing is. But they're finding especially animals who have had who have been blown backward, who have had the kind of trauma that looks like they got hit by a truck. And that is spooky. Another thing about those mammoths, the plant matter that they were digesting, it wouldn't have grown in the region they were found. So, I mean, it is the sort of mystery that needs to be solved. But I bet nine out of 10 people don't even know about it. So credit to the Oppenheimer Ranch, especially to them, because I found them and this was an issue I knew very little about until I found them. And now I would put it in the top three, uh, maybe number one. I mean, if it ain't number one, it's, it's set aside so something else can get done. Um, all right. The, the mammoth also was found in a fully erect um, state of being. And the only reason this is worth mentioning is that happens when you are literally blown up like a balloon. So whatever happened to him, it blew him backward with enough force to break his legs. It froze him instantly. We'll say in a two hour time frame, the sort of thing that when you work out the physics of it requires temperatures of minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 180, I think was one of the other estimates. When minus, what is it, 212, or that's boiling, whatever the absolute zero is, these are the sorts of, of, of environmental calamities you have to envision for the result to exist that we discovered. It, this isn't one of those things, well, how much evidence do you need before you start to realize that maybe some, okay, the fact that this can be backed up with other animals in similar traumatic condition is, in my opinion, frightening enough that this is no longer a discussion that we can have. Because if that's really what happens, well, wouldn't you rather just be eating lunch? I mean, ultimately, there's not enough time to fix it. 
I don't know. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. But if if you uh, if you at this point uh, have no idea what I'm talking about, maybe you shouldn't. No, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe there's ever ever a time that you're better off in the dark about anything. I just don't believe that. So if I am fear mongering here, then I uh, I feel terrible, but I don't think I am, and and unfortunately I don't think I am. But please talk me into how I am. I, I'll be glad to listen. I just. I don't think I am. All right. So off to um, too much, cheated too much. Yeah, okay. Lied too much, cheated too much. Um, I, I, I think any lying and any cheating is too much. And I didn't really cheat, especially at things like schoolwork. I just, or, or games. Um, well, I mean, I would cheat the casino if I could. I tried once. It didn't work. But, uh, yeah, I, you know, but I don't respect intellectual property. I don't see that as a line that gets drawn. But I do understand the line. It's not like I don't get what our legal precedents are. I just don't, I don't agree with it. So when I look at how I fit into society, um, I think of myself as having to, um, as previously having to lie and cheat my way through my insecurities and self-loathing as my defense mechanism to just not deal with it, to be honest. And then once none of that seemed to matter anymore, well, then it wasn't like I was dealing with it. I just had become somebody different. So that's part of the reason I have really no shame in telling anything about from where I come and what I've done since while it does help define where I'm going and what I'm doing now, it helps define it. It doesn't dictate it. It doesn't limit it. It doesn't, um, it doesn't hinder or somehow refrain my potential to still do exactly what I want to do with my life from here forward. And that was the ultimate limitation that I had never understood I was putting on myself. And now, unfortunately, with that champagne bottle uncorked, well, we are bubbling all over the place. Unlike geological time. Understanding geological time is my one of my current conundrums. And I do think we have inside of the reckoning that comes with the catastrophic uh, upheaval Earth goes through, I think we have an entire rethinking to uh, correct our idea of time as it's revealed through the uh, prehistoric record and the rock record specifically of planet earth and what i mean by this is i think there's evidence of significant upheaval regularly way more so than just the ice ages i don't think that's i i think that is if anything a condition that is uh an a component of something more cyclical i really think we might be trapped in a magnetic well, maybe not magnetic, but I have a feeling... What am I saying? Oh, yeah, shit, tennis. Okay, good thing I set that alarm, see? Good for me, good for me. Um, I, I fear Earth is... I fear Earth has a, a 13,000, roughly, year reset that is significant. That is, we got to get underground significant. I don't even know if that's enough. And uh, this is something I didn't think two, three years ago. But I believe it now. And i got to say, this is part of the woo-woo stuff. So I'll get much more into that in my next round of conspiracies. The 25th episode, which 
five away. All right, um, I'm going to try to run through the rest of these real quick. So, uh, okay. Uh, I don't need to do those. Uh, ridiculously burdened by my own worries. Uh, I still am a little bit ridiculously burdened by that, but if you feel you're overwhelmed by the the pain and suffering of society around you, the only way to get out of that, for me, was always to either get so distracted that I that it would be one of those recollections of, wow, I hadn't thought about that for six hours. Well, that doesn't really work because as soon as you come back, you almost have all six hours of distracted time to catch up on. So if, if you are, uh, I don't want to call it empathic, but if you're susceptible to letting the grander scheme pull you into a malaise, uh, my two outs right now are music and taking my dog for a walk. So if you are, you have to, you have to get your sensory input down to something manageable. That's why I recommend music. Put your earbuds on. I don't care if it's talk radio. It's something that you're engaging with that's blocking out the rest of it. And then an activity that you don't even have to enjoy it. I don't always enjoy taking my dog for a walk, but I always enjoy what my dog gets out of the walk. So it's why I choose that activity because her reaction changes my reaction. Now that for me is built in. Like as soon as I start to get even itchy, I don't know, wound up of any sort, I put on music. And if that's not enough, I take my dog for a walk. And if that's not enough, well, then I go down to the tennis wall and hit against the wall or something active. Keep myself just working through activity to a new mindset. And you'll get rid of the, the vibration that is affecting you. Those are my recommendations. That's all I got. That's my, why did we even go there? Oh yeah, because I'm ridiculously burdened by the worries of society. All right. Well, why? Because... There have been 30,177 either former or current military who have committed suicide since 9-11. Lost in active duty during the same period of time? Just over 7,000. 7,057. If that's not enough to make you feel burdened by the worries of society, I don't know. I'm going to read this this. Stat again, because maybe you didn't hear it. Since 9-11, 30,177, either former or active military, have committed suicide. 7,057 have been lost in their responsibilities and duties as military, active military. So... That's sick. I can't, I cannot hug enough returning military and tell them it's not their fault. There are, there, there aren't enough hugs. Look at, look at the numbers. When that number gets more to, we, <sighs> again, I just don't, I don't know why we're working on the problems we're working on and not the problems like that. Um, <laughs> and for total suicides in 2020, I did find that number, 2021, sorry. There was a drop um, from the 48,000 in 2019 to 44,000 something in 2021. Sorry, this is 2020 and 2021. 48,000, 44,000. And it was just over 48 and it was like 44 and a half. Uh, and that, that's better than 2019 and maybe even 2018. 
but drug overdoses are through the roof, like sickly. They're a hard one to find the data on because they quantify them in, in accidental adult deaths or something like that. There is no specific quantification for drug overdose. But three million people fell into this category. I think it was 3.2 million across the United States. 3.2 million. And listen, if you don't think a drug overdose is suicide, well, it might not be one out of 20 times, but it is every other time. Okay. Uh, running through the rest of this, uh, I think it's the Jaro Mountains, or Jara, but it definitely was J Mountains, where you can find those granite uh, anomalies, the granite boulder. They're, that's not the only granite boulder anomaly. It's the best one. But if you go looking for more examples of that, <laughs> they're all over the world. Um, okay, antelope brain juice. Uh, that was kind of a terrible phrase. But I, I, I know where that's coming from because... Somewhere I learned that it was by the ingestion of meat or even brain matter that our brains might have responded and gotten more functional. But I also know that our brains at some point went from what is what, roughly 40 cubic centimeters or something? I'm not sure if that's the right size to 90 cubic centimeters, but that's the right ratio. And then since then has reduced back down to 80. And they think that something to do with technology spurred the growth in brain size. Like when we learned agriculture and the whole concept of civilizing, uh, that that spurred our brains to double the capacity to that comes with having that level of integration. And then as we started to systematize, our brain shrank. I don't know. That was some YouTube video I watched. Could it be true? Sure. Could it be bullshit? Sure. But I'm sharing with you because I found it interesting. You can't deny the fact that our brains have gone through two major changes. And most animals, this is not true of whatsoever. So it is unusual that our brains doubled in capacity and have since reduced. Both are interesting. Um, okay. Ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba. Mental framework you'll tolerate becomes who you are. But that doesn't change who you really are. Okay. I'm just going to say I'm not religious. As a matter of fact, I'm an atheist. I grew up total atheist. You definitely have a soul. It matters. So what you hear telling you that this isn't who you are, whatever you're doing that makes you feel like this isn't who I really am. It's, it's your eternal connection to yourself saying that. If you don't want to listen to that, I didn't listen to it forever. I didn't believe it. I didn't think it mattered. And I'm not here to convince you it does. But that little part of you that knows it's not really you is proof that you have become something that you're not. You can become something that you are by simply stopping the activities that you know aren't really you. And none of us came here to lie, but none of us came here to be victims. So if your actions are so heinous that you will be victimized for telling truth, well, I know that you're going to need the ball to start rolling before you want to join a train of truth because we don't, we don't have people standing up and saying, I fucked up. I did this wrong. I, I could have done better. I, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Please know that at least my intentions were good. So that's who I am. That's what I offer. I offer correction of my mistakes I offer no more antelope brain juices. Well, at least I won't be cracking their skulls open, sucking it down during the podcast. Podcast? Whatever. 
I offer trying to find somebody to help me get a conversation going here. I actually am thinking about my mom on the first one on that, but maybe not. That might be a conversation even I'm not ready for. Um, and I offer the, <laughs> I offer the entire third page I didn't get to because this has been too long already. So enough is enough, but I can't leave without saying, listen, I didn't mean to dismiss that moment where the statistics show me 30% of, of, uh, American black men are saddled with a felony record versus 8% of men overall. Well, that seems like it's almost all black dudes. Now, I am one white dude with a felony, so at least I'm throwing my name in the pool. But for fuck's sake, 30% of black men have a felony record. <laughs> wherever I look, wherever I look, all I got to do is go looking for a little bit of truth. And I see more, pop, more problems than I have enough lifetimes to give effort to. But... It feeds my soul to identify problems of which there is there is rewarding work to be done. And this is indulgent time. This recording, my voice for posterity's sake, is nothing more than me being, well, me clarifying who I am for myself so that whatever's on that list that is the most important isn't the kind of thing I'm going to say isn't worth doing because I don't want to feel like anything can stop me from at least providing the most beneficial impact I have left to give to everybody else I'm sharing this ride with. I don't expect the same from you. I just feel like if you're looking for something and you just don't even know really what you're looking for, well, I relate to you. You may not want to listen to any of this shit. I would relate to that too.